the same strain with the same DNA, depending <coughs> on the ground where it is planted, on the water supply, on the climate, uh, gives rise to different varieties. That's it, uh, why we have different wines uh, in many regions uh, of the countries. And uh, with cannabis, it's the same thing. Uh, of course, we have many strains of cannabis with different DNAs, but even for, for the same strain, uh, we have a lot of variety and ratios of uh, cannabinoids and terpene. Because these are molecules that plants use to defend themselves. Animals, when they feel danger, they move, they run away. Plants are attached to soil, they can run, so they must uh, develop chemical defenses. Uh, and these cannabinoids and terpenes are molecules that they develop to defend themselves from insects, from a, a poor water supply, from adverse uh, climate conditions. Uh, so they are defense mechanisms. We see that today, this is a modern growth plant for cannabis. Uh, plants uh, are fed the exact nutrients they need, the exact amount of water, the exact light, uh, the temperature is controlled, the humidity also. Do these plants need defense against what? Uh, do they have any worries of survival? So, I ask myself, I ask you, uh, how rich may be their content in cannabinoids and their things? I doubt. Uh, to get an idea also, uh, many commercial companies that grow cannabis are using genetically engineered cannabis. Uh, this is an example with roses. Uh, you know the wild roses, uh, you see here, there are flowers in different phases of maturation, uh, simultaneously in the same plant. Uh, you smell them, they have an intense perfume. Uh, you put uh, uh, these roses in a jar at home and they are alive and smelling uh, for <coughs> over one week. But when you go to the flower shop, you get this. Uh, they are carbon copies of each other. I'm not saying these are not beautiful, they are. Uh, but they are all the same. And you smell them and they smell nothing. You put them in a jar at your house and the next day or two days after they are there, uh, this is genetical engineer, this is wild thing, and for cannabis, I think much of this is also true. Also, another fact that we know, uh, there are many medications that came from plants, uh, everybody knows that, but what the pharmacist and the pharmacy industry is used to, is to uh, identify the, the molecule that is active, and then isolate it, and then make and sell the drug. This is what pharmacists do. Uh, from C sponge, we got this important cytostatic drug for leukemia, the citarabine, the AZT for AIDS. From the perlinco, we get the vinca alkaloids, and many other examples, but all the same process, uh, finding the active molecule, single molecule, isolate it and make the drug. With cannabis, uh, that's not the case. We have a lot, hundreds of small, different molecules that act together. Uh, and some molecules enhance the effects of others, and other molecules counteract the uh, secondary effects of others. So uh, it's the whole of the plant uh, the reunion of all these molecules in different proportions that gives cannabis uh, its potential, its action. It's like the wine. Wine is not made of one molecule. It's a lot of molecules. We all know that wine has water, it has alcohol, but it has hundreds of other molecules and there are hundreds, thousands of different things. Another thing we know uh, if you go, for instance, for Amsterdam, it's the capital of the recreational cannabis, and you search for all the different strains, 
you get always get in the label uh, the proportions of these two cannabinoids. These are only two of hundreds of different cannabinoids that are present in the plant. Uh, but these are uh, landmarks, the CBD and THC. And uh, you know that the, the psychoactive effects are more uh, in relation with THC and more relaxing effects more in relation to CBD. But there are many others, hundreds of different cannabinoids and things that also have, have actions. That uh, uh, it's because uh, they have a lot of strains with uh, very creative names that you can choose from. From my experience, the plants, the strains that have medical interest are in this range, 10, 20, 20, 10, between CBD and THC. Uh, the others I don't know, uh, but I want to try different compositions of those others and see the differences uh, the moment I have cannabis available to, to give to patients that I don't have. Uh, patients, unfortunately, still have nowadays to buy their cannabis in the black market. Uh, there is uh, one formulation uh, being sold in pharmacies, in Portuguese pharmacies, authorized by the Infarmed, uh, that has this composition. We know nothing else. Uh, it's a genetically engineered cannabis with zero CBD that I consider dangerous and uh, uh, I do not prescribe it and advise patients and fellow doctors to also not prescribe it. Uh, they should be, the main uh, cannabinoid should be in this interval. So, we must admit we know little yet about cannabis, but we know much less about the genetically engineered cannabis, so it is a risk to use it in patients, and we should always, if possible, opt for wild cannabis strains. Our major problem in oncology, and that is uh, why I became interested 30 years ago in the use of cannabis, is this. Uh, people with advanced cancer that are uh, very ill, simply because they have the disease, they lose their appetite. Uh, and they have the an anorexia that is uh, related to the disease itself. But then we intervene, we start medicating patients, and we iatrogenically induce nausea because we do chemo to patients, and the chemo drugs are uh, nausea induces, and also we must treat cancer pain and the best analgesics are opioids that also have this secondary effect. And this nausea adding to the anorexia that gives uh, uh, this uh, picture of uh, very sick people. They begin losing their fat and then they also lose their muscles and they become so severely ill that they might die of hunger. Uh, but we know, and everybody that tries it knows, uh, that cannabis can stop all this. Cannabis increases the, the appetite markedly and uh, stops this. But also, it is a very powerful anti emetic uh, medication that simply counteracts the nausea inducing uh, properties of chemotherapy and opioids. It is very important and it's the only drug that has 100% efficacy in doing this. Well, the chemo treatments are based on an ideal situation, an ideal uh, cell kinetics. Uh, we start with a patient that has normal blood counts, then we give the first treatment and the chemo drugs are just poisons. They, don't have, they are not specific for cancer cells. Uh, they kill cells, point. And so they kill malignant cells, yes, but they also kill normal cells. But then normal cells recover very quickly. That's because uh, it's because you are fine, because your bone marrow is normal and recovers very quickly. Also, after one uh, treatment of chemotherapy, the 
bone marrow responds and recovers quickly, and when the patient has already a normal blood count, it's time to do the second treatment. The malignant cells, yeah, they, they don't talk to each other, they don't know they were amputated, uh, they keep descending, the uh, patient is steps are logarithmic steps, ideally, and uh, that's how we try to cure cancer with chemotherapy, and in some cancers we uh, accomplish that. This is the principle. But to do this, you must be in top shape. And uh, when the, uh, you are doing chemo and not consuming cannabis, you are nauseated, you go home, in that interval between treatments, you don't eat, and then your bone marrow does not recover, and you appear to the second treatment with very low blood counts, and then we have two options, or reduce the dose of the cytostatics, or delay the next post until a full recovery. And either option induces disease progression, ultimately death. Also, if you are not yet, if you don't drink, and it's very important to drink because when uh, patients are in the hospital, uh, we can put them on an IV infusion. But when they are at home, they must drink anything, water, beer, whatever. I recommend my patients to drink at least three liters a day of liquids. Uh, but if they are nauseated, they don't drink. And that increases and aggravates the nephrotoxicity of many cytostatic, many first lines cytostatics like cisplatin. Uh, and then a patient appears with a, a poor kidney function and we must change to non-nephrotoxic but less uh, drugs with less efficacy and so this is progression and ultimately death. Also having a cancer and uh, doing chemotherapy uh, elicits uh, neuropsychic symptoms and the uh, patients that don't consume cannabis, stupid patients, they go to psychiatrists and then they can with a prescription of several uh, psychopharmaceuticals official. And uh, those drugs interact with chemo drugs and they also induce some ineffectiveness of chemotherapy. And so not consuming cannabis is bad for patients that are on chemotherapy. Uh, we have very clear experimental evidence, uh, indisputable, that uh, cannabinoids, mainly the THC, uh, are very effective against chemo-induced nausea and vomit in patients and animals. And it says here both phases, what is this? Uh, there is the immediate nausea that the patients uh, experiment when the chemo is being infused, but then there is the delayed nausea that appears a few days after the chemotherapy and uh, can prolong for many days, and that is terrible for, for patients. Uh, for the immediate nausea, we have moderately good uh, medications like the zinc 5H3 inhibitor receptor. Uh, like the Ondestron or the Ranistron or the inhibitors of Radikinin like the Apretitan. But for the late nausea, there is nothing in the pharmacy that uh, is effective. And THC, uh, cannabis rich in THC, is very effective in my experience, 100% effective in counteracting this late nausea that is terrible for patients. So, uh, it's not just uh, a matter of quality of life. Of course, it's better to not be nauseated than being nauseated. But it's really because of all these problems that I mentioned. Uh, the difference between life and death. So, uh, nowadays, I can say very convinced of this truth, that doing chemotherapy without associating cannabis is bad medical practice, is dangerous. All this that has to be with our main problem, that is the nausea and all the complications induced by the nausea. There are several investigations and you'll hear about that. 
uh, in other talks, that cannabinoids also have direct actions in cancer. They, there are many scientific works, I'm just going rapidly over this, uh, that prove that some cannabinoids, uh, and we know yet very little, uh, have direct anti-cancer actions uh, like inducing apoptosis, uh, many things, and they are they also interact very significantly with the immune system. Cannabinoids have lots of Im immune modifying functions that uh, we are still uh, just beginning to learn something. Also, another problem with chemo patients uh, uh, is because of the low blood counts. Uh, they are immunocompromised and we have problems uh, with the uh, infections and uh, in large hospitals the, the bacterial resistance to antibiotics is becoming a bigger and bigger problem and we know that there are cannabinoids that they have potent antimicrobial properties that do not have resistance and that is also a pathway to be explored. Uh, this article is very curious to me because of the date. It is from 40 years ago in a very prestigious journal, the British Journal of Pharmacology, and it clearly states this, uh, that you can have a, a low-dose cannabis formulation that gives you what you want uh, to be calm and tra tranquilizing effect, without the uh, psycho symptoms. Uh, the doses needed to have uh, these effects that we see uh, are much lower than the doses needed to feel anything psychoactive. So, uh, we ask ourselves, if you know this for 40 years, why don't psychiatrists and family doctors prescribe cannabis to patients? And we also know that in civilized countries, more than half the population is taking uh, benzodiazepines, is taking antidepressants, is taking a lot of neuropsychic active drugs um, with uh, several side effects. And uh, why don't they use cannabis? That is the safest drug of all. That's the history. So, what are the obstacles for the generalized use of cannabis? I think these are the main ones. Uh, let's analyze each of them. Mm -hmm. The most important factor to uh, cannabis not being generally used is prejudice. Prejudice, we know that it's generated by fear and also ignorance. And if uh, we can understand the prejudice from the general public that is fooled by the the media and the politics, as always, uh, that is a little bit harder to understand that uh, medical personnel, doctors and nurses have a lot of prejudice against cannabis. And uh, if we ask any of them, uh, why do, are you against cannabis? They always talk about two things, that it's the addictive properties of cannabis, they say, and uh, the induction of psychosis. Well, as for addiction, addiction is a complex uh, situation that has four components uh, that are here explained and compared. The withdrawal, uh, severity uh, of the symptoms when we uh, remove a drug. Uh, no surprise that it's the alcohol, the most severe. The delirium tremens is a clinical situation that is potentially fatal and must be carefully treated. Uh, because it can lead to that. Uh, cannabis has no withdrawal symptoms. Then the reinforcement. When you, you take one dose of a drug, you will uh, crave for the next dose. Uh, no surprise that it's cocaine being at some level as caffeine. When you, you take a coffee, you don't begin craving for the next coffee. That's stupid. Uh, then the dependence. 
also not a surprise that uh, uh, most uh, dependence uh, inducing drug is nicotinide dependent on nicotine. Uh, but uh, and it's a major health problem. And you see that cannabis uh, has no dependence. I have had hundreds of patients taking cannabis during their chemo treatments. I've never seen anyone become dependent on cannabis when they stop treatment, they stop cannabis, or they start using it recreationally two or three times a year uh, in a party. Never a dependent patient uh, on cannabis. And I've treated hundreds of patients taking during their chemo treatments that last for many months, uh, taking cannabis daily. Never, no one became dependent. Then the tolerance, that's another factor of addition. Uh, we need each time a higher dose to get the same effect. Also not a surprise that the uh, start here is heavy. Uh, you need to get higher and higher doses to get the same effect. That does not happen with uh, cannabis. So for the addiction, if people do some research and investigate, uh, they should know that it's not true that cannabis is an addictive drug. Also, they, they talk a lot about, <coughs> uh, about the psychosis induced by cannabis. Well, we must distinguish <coughs> between the, the acute intoxication, that's what we seek when we use cannabis for recreation. <coughs> uh, and the, the psychotic symptoms are actually very nice. Uh, if you don't believe it, try it. It's a very safe drug. Do try it. And you'll find that they are very nice and they disappear after a few hours. Then there are, in fact, a few uh, papers from psychiatrists uh, that say that they have psychotic patients uh, induced by cannabis, they say. But if you read carefully the papers, in all of them, they are uh, talking about people that started cannabis at a very young age, at 12, 13. They uh, use it daily and they keep that consumption for years. Well, something must be very wrong for a 12 year old boy or girl to start smoking cannabis at 12 and uh, smoking it daily for many years. That is strange, yes? Perhaps uh, that young boy uh, already has a psychiatric con pre-existent condition and surely uh, he has also a very uh, bad family, a very bad environment to be able to smoke cannabis every day from 12 or 13 to adult. Uh, and perhaps that bad environment, that bad family, that uh, pre-existent condition that led him to do this uh, is much more related to the late psychosis that he develops than the use of the cannabis itself. Uh, so I am convinced that cannabis is not a psychosis inducer. Uh, Cannabis consumption was just uh, an happy phenomenon in the life of these very disturbed people. Also, some companies that sell cannabis products behave badly. We have in a very large uh, chain store of uh, natural products in Portugal. Uh, on sale, this oil, uh, it says cannabis active. Patients have heard that cannabis is good uh, for their health. And they try to, you know, buy this. Uh, but you see the price. Uh, it's uh, 50 milliliters for 50 euros. It's uh, 1,000 euros per liter. Well, and this is oil from the seeds. Uh, and the seeds don't have cannabinoids. Cannabinoids are produced and stored in the flowers of the, of the plants in these uh, white <coughs> organelles called trichomes. Uh, it's, uh, dry trichomes, the powder of the dry trichomes compressed that makes the ashes. Uh, here are cannabinoids from seeds. It's a normal oil, but if people want oil from seeds, they can have alternatives. <laughs> it's cheaper and the chemical composition 
very much alive. So it's completely uh, foolish to buy this attractive, buy this misleading uh, works of Canary Fatima. Also, uh, we have now 34 companies that are producing cannabis in Portugal, licensed by the National Authority for Drugs. And what do I have in my hospital to be in my patients? Zero. Uh, it's revolting. The, the law that legalized medical cannabis is from 2018. Uh, five years have passed. I have zero cannabis in my hospital and in other, other hospitals of the country to be able to give my patients. And that really uh, makes me mad. Also, the security forces, they are obsessed with cannabis, I don't know why. And they, uh, every day, they make arrests for simple possession or cultivation of cannabis, maybe many patients, as they don't have uh, at ease to go to the black market, they plant two or three plants in their courtyard, and the uh, security forces arrest them. Uh, this young people was last week, two weeks ago, was arrested here in Cuba with 13 doses of passion. This is a perfectly normal quantity to have. This is not traffic, but he was arrested. Uh, and this contributes to the prejudice, because this comes in the news. Uh, well, the, our national authority also gets that. Uh, in civilized world, this is what doctors get access uh, when they, uh, they get uh, cannabis oil. Uh, we see here that uh, we have analysis of uh, the content of many cannabinoids and terpenes, the, their quantity, but also the pesticide uh, eventual content that must be there and also residual solvent. Also, microbiological results for bacteria and fungi. This, as I say, is in the civilized world. Because uh, here, <laughs> that's what the infrared think it's enough for me to know about the two only preparations of cannabis that are available in the market. The infrared thinks that I don't need to know nothing else besides this. Uh, to be able to prescribe cannabis to patients. And this uh, is obviously not true. I need to know much more. Uh, they are so much obsessed to be anti cannabis uh, that they just reinforce that the industrial thing, that there's no THC, is forbidden in cosmetic products. Why? Why can't I have a uh, hand cream? With industrial hemp, no, it's cannabis, it's a seed, so it must be forbidden. It, it's our current reality in Portugal. So, for the future, what are my suggestions? Uh, for medical doctors, they should, of course, combat the prejudice, studying, doing investigation, and once and for all, understand that cannabis has advantages uh, over various normal drugs in numerous clinical situations. Also, listen to patients. Uh, maybe, for instance, uh, there are many schizophrenic patients uh, that are doing well. Uh, in schizophrenia, uh, patients have to take uh, neuroleptics for the the rest of their lives, like diabetic patients must take insulin, but neuroleptics have a lot of side effects, and cannabis can counteract many of those side effects, and the clever schizophrenics, uh, they consume moderate amounts of cannabis to uh, inhibit the side effects of neuroleptics, to keep them calm and to keep them well. They just so they simply omit that information, but if doctors got used to listen to patients without judging them, 
They would learn a lot from patients uh, that are using cannabis and are doing very well. To the security forces, I would say, stop. We get obsession. It's completely uh, unnecessary. And uh, if they read the law, Portugal was the one of the first countries to decriminalize uh, cannabis. But uh, they insist on every day and uh, always on the news that they have apprehended, they are going to stop traffic. Let the cannabis from the, the North Africa enter. Why not? It's a safe trend. It doesn't harm anybody. Uh, on the other way, corruption uh, in the town halls, government, many of those, yes, are serious crimes that harm everybody. Uh, change your focus. Look the other way. Uh, when um, the abortion was prohibited in Portugal, it was a crime till 97. Um, there were over 10,000 abortions per year. The security forces were not arresting women uh, or doctors that made those abortions. Uh, 10,000, 15,000 abortions per year, they arrested one or two just uh, to not say that they were doing nothing. But they looked the other way. The security forces went to the abortion clinics with their wives, their daughters, their girlfriends to do abortions. They knew it was a crime, and possessing cannabis is not a crime. Uh, they knew it was a crime, and they simply looked the other way. And they should start doing this with cannabis right now. Look the other way. We can be uh, As for the infarmer, uh, they should get some sense uh, to facilitate the placement in the hospital where the patients are. Uh, and give the doctor the freedom to prescribe them whenever they see fit. Because the infarmer made a regulation for the use of medical cannabis. And it says very clearly that cannabis is only uh, may be used when every other thing has failed. Well, we know that in many situations cannabis is more effective and by far it's the safest drug there is. Why should we wait for all the other drugs to fail to be able to use cannabis? Why not use it first time? Uh, but they, they are not thinking clearly and uh, uh, they make stupid regulations. And, uh, also demand from companies a very detailed independent analysis. We cannot rely on a commercial company uh, on this. But we have the faculties of pharmacy that have the hardware and capacity to do detailed analysis of the oils so that we know what we are prescribing to patients and, and that is a very important information. Final to the cannabis companies. You don't have access to patients. I do. Give me the oil so that I can give it to the patients. That's the only way we can generate medical experience. Uh, if you don't put the oil in my hands and the uh, cost production uh, is very low, uh, so why not give it for free? You are not selling it because I'm not prescribing. I'm not prescribing because I don't have experience with it. So break this vicious cycle and put the oil in my hands. Let me use it in patients, let me generate knowledge and then uh, in two, three years, uh, most certainly you, you will, will have uh, some very interactive products. In oncology, we should use all of wild cannabis as first-line treatment for hemorrhoids, nausea and vomiting. That's Undisputable. It's the most efficacious uh, drug we can give to any patient to inhale. But also do a phase four uh, study of all that administration. We must collect all data from patients and the composition of the oils that we are, we are giving them. Because every oil is different and even because the climate is different. And also analyze special immune systems. Because I think 
that's where calories will prove to be most useful as an immune modifying drug. <coughs> that's one focus of my, of, uh, my uh, investigation, my group. But I'm sure that in two, three years, uh, when we start analyzing that, all data that we collected with the help of modern artificial intelligence, we will get uh, very interesting. Just to have an idea what, of what it is possible to study nowadays in oncology, this is uh, studies made on, on lung cancer, but uh, just very quickly, uh, this is one of our big worries in the MDSC, the Alloy Reactor Suppressor Cells. When they rise, patients stop responding to chemotherapy, to, to chemotherapy, not because the cancer cells became resistant to the drugs, but because the immune system is not letting the, the cancer to die. Uh, also, uh, very beautiful things, computer generated, where you can see uh, visually um, each island of this one is a uh, a different cell population and uh, computer analysis of uh, this data uh, give very good insights. And we study already nowadays many uh, substances uh, from the cancer cells and the immune system cells and all these and make beautiful graphics of all kinds of laws. Uh, above this horizontal line, uh, things have statistical significance. For instance, uh, lung cancer patients that are doing immunotherapy have very high level of interleukin-10. Interleukin uh, patients that are doing chemotherapy have very, very high levels of metalloprotein. Well, all this uh, we study nowadays, and we should study all this back at, <coughs> along with the cannabis supplementation and see what uh, comes different on, on this and uh, we have possibility to have visual maps uh, of all these uh, parameters uh, and this is what should be done as a phase for accompaniment of uh, cannabis prescription to cancer patients. Then when we have a large uh, and if you, we collect everything for every patient along uh, the evolution of the disease and also the composition of the various cannabis oils we are giving them, we will get tremendous large amounts of data. And then, yes, in two, three years, I uh, think that we can have targeted uh, cannabinoid based uh, commercial drugs. And then, yes, you commercial companies can start to make big money. But for now, forget that. Give me the oil. Let me work with the patients. Uh, every little patient, patients. And, uh, because money will come, but not just now. And that's all. Ignorance, like you know, security forces, whatever, whoever. 
Um, and so don't you think that, you know, we are becoming to have the conditions bec because we have an increasing number of companies within this field. Mm -hmm. So do you think that we are closer? And in my view, I think we need a clinical trial. Okay. We might need a clinical trial for the society, not for you. Let me imply. Okay, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what is a clinical trial? Uh, it's a process that uh, where you study two things, the efficacy and the security. And what's the purpose of a clinical trial? Is to obtain a market introduction authorization. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now, for cannabis. Efficacy, you have it for 12,000 years. Security, you know it's the safest drug there is. It's safer than glucose, for instance. The LD50 for cannabis is higher than the LD50 for glucose. So it's the safest thing there is. So you don't need to study efficacy or security. And as for the market the authorization, you have the law 1912-2018 that legalized cannabis. So it's a, a law that comes from the parliament. It does not uh, come from the, a national authority, not from the government, it comes from the parliament. You mean the Portuguese parliament? Yes, yeah. it's a, a law of the country. Cannabis medical use is legalized. It is authorized to be in the market. And no, even people that are against cannabis, they can go against the law. That's one point. The second point is that the clinical trial is very expensive. And uh, in fact, nobody is going to pay for it because you have to pay patients insurance, you have to pay all that, and uh, there is no money to do it. The third aspect is that uh, you can do easily, uh, easily, as easily as it is, uh, clinical trial for one molecule. You cannot do a clinical trial for wine. Uh, what are you testing? The Doro wine, the Alentejo wine, and uh, for what year? And if you do the clinical trial with the Bayrada wine for 2021, uh, what tells you that that also applies to the wine for next year? That is different. And the cannabis oils are completely different uh, in the variety and the, the relative proportion of cannabis that have been. Uh, so it's not, I don't think it's possible to do any clinical. They are not necessary because we have all we need, the security, the efficacy and the authorization. They are very expensive, we don't have the money, but mostly there is not one molecule to another. Uh, there is a complex mixture that changes in every collection uh, from soil. And that's probably the problem of the regulatory authority because they don't really know what type of quality control mm -hmm. they have. But they just have to pay the faculty of pharmacy to do the analysis, and that's not expensive. 100 years, I think, or 200 years, okay. you can do a detailed analysis like that. Okay. That is done everywhere in the world. And that uh, faculty of pharmacy is not corrupt. Uh, mm -hmm. They are independent, they are reliable. Well, don't, don't you think that the interest might come from the companies that are already in this field? Companies want to make money now, and it's simple. Uh, because I don't prescribe, uh, they don't make money, yeah. you are in the hospital. Mm -hmm. Because we have access to patients, they don't have. Yeah. I do. And I can try to on hundreds of thousands of patients mm -hmm. and collect that they data. Can, yeah. And if they, uh, of course, I'm not going to make a secret of that data. They give me the oil, I give you the data. Anonymized, of course, but I give you the data. And then artificial intelligence is going to extract from that data precious knowledge. They are going to tell us which cannabinoid is the most potent antibiotic, which is the most potent uh, cytostatic against a particular form of cancer, uh, which is the best for diabetes. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are cannabinoids with anti diabetic uh, properties. Uh, we can get a lot of knowledge just uh, by collecting data, but we need to use cannabis, and for that I need the oil. Yeah, yeah. 
give me a bottle of yeah. oil. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> one last question because we have to move to the to the to the next speaker. Okay. <laughs> Before starting, I must make a declaration of interest because I work in the farm industry. <laughs> so, that's for us to know what, what, what is my starting point, <coughs> that, which is uh, so high philosophical. The, the question, I, it is, I don't think there is a contradiction. Uh, there are different opinions, of course, but there is not necessarily I, I didn't a say, contradiction. I didn't say there is a contradiction. Yes, I, I understand. I'm just reinforcing okay. that uh, medicine is not the only true in medicine, in my point of view is not uh, uh, evidence-based medicine. Is medicine behind the more than the, what is clinical for one aspect. The other aspect that goes a little bit in this direction that maybe metadata, metadata and uh, well-established use is also science and yes. can support a scientific use. On the other hand, to be a little bit uh, against the the, the excellent presentation of, of the doctor is the question that <coughs> the pharmaceutical music, the industry, try, tries to standardize uh, his uh, medicines, uh, namely, and that is uh, an European uh, regulation on that, because uh, cannabis is a, a plant that uh, is an, uh, an accumulated plant in Asia. So every uh, heavy metals, uh, environmental conditions, namely with the fire, etc., can bring toxicity to the product that goes along with the, the production of the medicines. And so, in fact, when we are doing extracts, when we are processing the, the, the plant, what we are ensuring is that uh, we don't uh, we remove, or, or not even remove, we don't accept in our production plan uh, things like toxins, heavy metals, uh, toxins that come from fungus and from other things. So we standardize because the quality and the safety of the patient is very important. And so I think we have a, a midterm, uh, we can have a midterm agreement on giving access to the patients, but in parallel, keeping the quality and keeping the safety, which is not guaranteed when you go to the black market. Mm -hmm. Sorry for my Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, sorry, we have to move to the other to the other talk. So thank you so much once again for the <laughs> So it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Alain.